today's video is about the Dane Axe, also known as the Great Axe. They certainly weren't exclusively used by Danes. We believe that these axes actually originate from the 900s or the 10th century. There is actually a statue, I believe, in uh, modern day Istanbul of what appears to be a Dane holding an axe very similar to this although the haft is probably another metre or so longer than this particular one. The haft that I based this on actually uh, is, is pretty much from the, uh, the Bayou Tapestry and most of the hafts on those axes are around about this length so that people can stand like so. The Dane Axe is a very interesting tool and it's, it's an extra, extraordinarily interesting weapon. It's not like most other axes. The first major difference is the length of the blade, which is this one, which does in fact vary. Uh, there are a number of finds in the London Museum and also at least one in the British Museum. There's uh, several others that have been found in different parts of the UK all of which, generally speaking, relate to uh, the reign of King Canute. Although, as I said before, this axe appears to uh, predate that by several hundred years, and there have been finds, as I understand it, throughout modern-day Scandinavia, uh, which relate to that. The second major difference is the, the fact that the axe is quite thin, this is a reenactment axe, so it is heavier and thicker than a traditional Dane axe that you might find in a museum or would have found on the day. But it's quite interesting all the same. So reenactment axes, at least in Australia, have to be at least three millimeters here, uh, thickness of the blade, and that way they're classed as being reenactment safe. This still could do a lot of damage to someone. However, uh, if we take a look at the blade, we should be able to see that it really is quite thin. I purchased this plus two more from a company called Make Your Own Medieval. I'll leave a link in the description below, one of which I've sharpened up and we're going to do some interesting cutting videos probably in a few days' time. I'm looking forward to that. However, let's talk about the Dane Axe. Why was this so interesting and why did this particular weapon creates such, I guess, uh, a bit of hysteria in the day, and it did, let me assure you. The simple reason is, I think, um, partially to do to the length of the heart, and that's, the, the, the main reason for this is the way this particular axe is used. It is, it is a, uh, I, I guess all you can just really describe it as, it's a weapon. Uh, when I went to get a half for it, I took this axe head into the, um, the hardware store uh, looking for something that might fit. And the closest I got was actually an oak um, hoe handle, which I've uh, shaved down to fit. And I had to explain to the guy what a Dane axe was. And in simple terms, it is a tool or a weapon uh, which is used to send your enemies either off to heaven or Valhalla. I've been, I've been a bit reenactor for several years now and I've uh, done weapon training for a long time. I really enjoy it and I really know my way around it. I train against swords all the time and again, I don't consider myself any kind of sword master but I am very confident with my use of a sword. And I believe that I could take on someone who had a sword coming against me. It's a strange psychology. Swords are a very different weapon and in the medieval period they would have been much less frequently used or much less common than you might think. These were really the weapon of the nobility or the upper classes. This would have cost a fortune, an absolute fortune at the time. Whereas an axe, whereas an axe like this would have been far more common. An axe like this could have been made very simply, piece of wood, from something like an ash tree or an oak tree, perhaps perhaps elm, unlikely, more so something like uh, birch, but more definitely oak. The actual axe head itself could quite easily be made from um, 
bog iron, and you have a commoner's weapon. This wouldn't, people would have used an axe all the time. They would have been very, very familiar with the, the physiology of how an axe works, how an axe hits, and how to achieve the result that you're looking for. Everyone, I think, really would have been carrying them from little kids right through the older people. This is how you hit your home with, with wood. You cut the wood with, with an axe like this. You would be cutting up meat, potentially, with an axe like this. You would be defending yourself with an axe like this. Well, strangely, using an axe purely for defence... Wow, it is a warm day here today. Using an axe purely for defence is, is not the best way to use an axe. And you can, um, and it's only a very small fragment of the potential of this, this axe. However, the psychology of a sword is that it can be used to subdue someone or uh, an opposing force. And so you can actually be very precise in the amount of force that you apply to someone with a sword. Ask any reenactor, um, because you don't want to be carrying out big hits on someone in a reenactment event because they're really not going to like you very much. Whereas an axe, you, you just can't do that. Once you've built up the kinetic energy of, of something like this, and using it to its potential, there is no way I'm stopping it. This axe is designed basically to start removing parts of your anatomy from you in a very clear, decisive and specific way. This axe is an incredibly powerful weapon. There are stories of the time of this axe being used to be able to split an enemy in half. There's stories about, um, on the Bayou Tapestry for example, of an Anglo-Saxon skull uh, decapitating a horse with one of these. And another story where uh, a Huskal basically cut off a knight's leg and then went well and truly into the horse with it. This is a, a, a fearsome weapon. And stories would have gotten around real quick uh, in, in the cultures of the day about these sorts of weapons. People would have understood the psychology behind it because a weapon in itself is not just about uh, the end result of the use of that weapon. In other words, this weapon is not about me being able to kill someone. This is about the, the psychology that I can project with this weapon. So in other words, if I was to be in a shield wall, one of the things that I can do with this weapon is I can reach forward and I can hook with it. You see the end of this, this point here, and by using that to hook, I can grab people's shields. I could grab people by the ankle and pull them out of the, the uh, shield wall. I can butcher that person in front of his colleagues. Can you imagine the psychology behind that action? These people in front of me would be losing their breakfast all over the place, watching people get uh, decapitated, lose limbs, lose hands, lose weapons, whatever. That would be a frightening sight to withhold. There's three more ways we can use this axe, at least. Um, okay. Obviously, I can punch with it, and it gives me a very long reach, much longer than a sword. You can use the butt for the same, although I, I don't really understand why you would do that. There is one find where there is a potentially a butt cap for one of these axes, although we don't really understand that, and I can't remember which grave site that came from. The next way we can use the axe is, is obviously with two hands at the base. By using it with two hands at the base, I build up a phenomenal amount of kinetic energy, especially with being dynamic on my feet I can, uh, I, I can project myself and I can take out an enemy very, very easily. Uh, and providing that I get the angle of the hit correct, uh, I could use that to destroy someone's shield or I could use that basically to kill them. Second, 
hands in the middle. This gives me a really good close quarter weapon, which would be fantastic for indoors uh, or within the urban environment of the day inside medieval villages, inside little towns, you know, around farmsteads, that kind of thing where buildings can be fairly close together. And if you look at um, descriptions, for example, of Winchester back in the 10th century, it was described as a rat warren of buildings. Lastly, uh, I can have uh, one hand at the very top and one hand in the middle. Again, this gives me a phenomenal amount of um, very precise hitting capability and much more so that I can really um, control where I'm hitting it. What I have found with this axe is it's actually a little bit difficult to judge the exact distance between myself and the target. And that's probably down to lack of experience. Because I've only had this axe for a fairly short period of time and I've not had a great deal of exposure to using it. We know that uh, King Canute uh, introduced these into uh, what was England during his reign, or at least that's when they first started to appear in England that we know of through descriptions and also archaeological evidence. That said, there's absolutely nothing to say that these weren't in the UK um, much, much earlier on, but it's, it's, there's no evidence to back that up. Interestingly, um, what, what King Canute did, and I, this may not have been specifically him, but certainly under his reign, he changed the formation of the Anglo-Saxon military and made it a much more professional force. We, there's still a lot of speculation in the historical community about exactly how this worked and what exactly this meant. But the understanding is that there were approximately three to three and a half thousand Huskarls under King Canute. The Huskarls were a household bodyguard, um, paid professional soldiers basically. Although there's a lot of speculation about whether or not they were really effective soldiers or not. Um, everyone that I have spoken to believes that they were and it certainly seems to be that way in the descriptions but a lot of people in, in the community, in, in the historical community seem to um, be casting some doubt on. During the Anglo-Saxon period um, there were always were professional soldiers within the, uh, the lords, nobles, barons whatever you want to call them, um, earls, bodyguards, um, and whether that was just a small number or a much larger number would have obviously depended on who can afford what and what they needed them for. Obviously, if you are intending to invade a neighbouring county or go across to Ireland to do some raiding or something like that, then um, you might want to take some more professional soldiers with you. There was also the fjord uh, in Anglo-Saxon times, and this was basically uh, everyone in well, all the males in Anglo-Saxon period were considered warriors and everyone had to have a shield, a helmet and a spear and be willing to provide about 40 or so days service to the, the Lord or the King. Oh, oh very warm day here in Brisbane. Um, under King Canute he transformed this into what certainly I and, and many other historians believe to be he kept the fjord, but he tr transformed the Huskarls into a, a much more potent military force. We also believe that during the Battle of Hastings, there were in fact about three and a half to four thousand Huskarls present, certainly um, at the the Battle of um, Stamford Bridge. Um, how many of those actually survived and went down to Hastings is debatable, and I don't believe there are any precise records that show. Uh, however, um, so we have an understanding there of, of, of the Huskarls and it's the Huskarls that are most famed for using the Danax um, and, and this would have been a feared weapon. The Normans would have known about this and that's I find that a bit interesting and a bit strange because um, Harold Goodwinson, uh, who later became King Harold, um, was essentially kept under house arrest by William Duke of Normandy for a period and even went on campaign with William Duke of Normandy 
we understand that he had a number of his a, a, a number of his Huskals with him, uh, and they would have been armed much as they would have been at Hastings. Um, pretty much everyone of the day would have been in chainmail, a conical helmet, um, spears, kite shield, and that kind of thing. But William Duke of Normandy would have seen himself uh, the effects of these Danaxes and would have been very familiar with it from his own conflicts with um, so-called Viking raiders. So I find it a bit interesting. One of the questions that I saw recently online was, is this an anti-cavalry weapon? And the short answer to that is no. Uh, this is not an anti-cavalry weapon. Um, obviously it was used and could be used as an anti-cavalry weapon. It's a little bit like saying, however, that um, you know a sniper rifle could be used to disable an armoured vehicle. Um, because, yes, it could, because you can take out the driver and the crew, uh, or, or potentially the tyres if you have the right ammunition. But so there we go guys, that's my introduction to the Danax. Uh, we'll be doing a cutting video very shortly and then we'll also be doing uh, some reviews fairly soon on this uh, particular axe. I look forward to seeing you in those videos. Please like, subscribe and share and I'll catch you in my next video.